One of the saddest victories I believe that the devil has been able to accomplish is the controversy surrounding baptism today. It is something that has caused me a lot of heartache through the years. You study with people, you get them nearly ready to obey the gospel, and then we run into a problem because their understanding of baptism and what the scriptures actually teach are not the same at all. And so through the years, I have spent a lot of time looking at every aspect of baptism and trying to come up with a comprehensive way to help people understand and see that they have been deluded by the concepts that, are, that have come down by tradition from our ancestors. So it's almost exactly what Peter talked about. He said the vain manner of life handed down from your fathers. And the manner of life handed down from Catholicism and from the Reformation movement, namely the Episcopalian Church, the Baptist Church, the Lutheran Church, and the Presbyterian Church, have all taught grave errors on the subject of baptism. And so over the years, as I say, I've been looking at various elements, and one of the things that we want to talk a little bit more this evening is that God didn't introduce baptism from Jesus God introduced baptism from John. And although John's baptism and Jesus' baptism differ in a couple of material points, they are the same in a couple of even more important points. And so just like we go back to the Old Covenant to look at prayer and how they prayed and to look at worship and how they worshiped, and we understand that there are some differences between how they worshiped in the Old Covenant and how they worshiped in the New Covenant, and yet there are some similarities as well. There are some psalms that are very helpful in describing the kind of worship that we should be doing. And so I think that John's baptism has been overlooked it is something that we need to look at and we need to try to understand what exactly was God trying to accomplish. And so we're going to start a series of lessons on baptism. And this evening, we're going to look at the type of John's baptism, types and shadows, the way that God chose to help us understand. So God introduced baptism to Israel in the following way. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets... John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, I think it's important that we understand that there is a direct link here between the beginning of the gospel and the preaching of John. And John's preaching is summed up as the preaching of of what? A baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And so as John introduces baptism to Israel, he links it, first of all, to water. He links it to immersion. He links it to the remission of sins. And he links it to repentance. And so as John is preaching his baptism, we see that those are the central core of this new teaching. That baptism is for remission of sins, that baptism is linked to repentance, that baptism is in water, and that baptism is an immersion. They're all very clearly set forth here, and you can actually see a lot of it in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, one of the last slides we're going to look at is the, the parallel between the first verse of Mark. Notice, this is, these are the first verses of Mark, and the last verses of Mark. In the first Mark, verses of Mark, we are told that the beginning of the gospel was John preaching baptism. At the end, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. There is a direct link, excuse me, a direct link between what Mark started the gospel with and how Mark ended his gospel. He started it with baptism. He ended it with baptism. And I think that that's a critical point that we sometimes lose sight of when we simply allow people to start in Mark 16. Well, yeah, we can start in Mark 16, but it really didn't start there. It started when God introduced it to Israel, and God links it directly to the beginning of the gospel. So there was no baptism in the Old Covenant. There was nothing mentioned about baptism. There was no mention even of remission of sins in the Old Covenant. Both baptism and remission of sins are a part of the gospel. And that's why when John is asked, where do you get the authority from this? 
He says, I get my authority from the coming one. I get my authority from what's coming, not from what is past. And John is preaching a part of the gospel. And I think it's critical that we also see that he is baptizing in the Jordan River. Clearly being baptized in the Jordan River. And it's interesting, I won't do it today, but next week we will. We'll see that when Jesus was baptized, he went down into the water. John baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him. When Philip sees the, or excuse me, when the Ethiopian eunuch sees the water, he says, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? And they both went down into the water. He baptized him and they both came up out of the water. There's a direct parallel between the baptism that John introduced to Israel and the baptism that we are practicing today. Now, again, they're, they're, they differ in a couple of material points. But John came to prepare Israel for the Messiah and to introduce the Messiah and to introduce baptism. <clears throat> In the book of John, he says this, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Can we really appreciate the significance of what John is saying here about baptism? Baptism is not an Old Testament ordinance at all. It was introduced by God to Israel. Now, God could have set it aside, but he didn't. He introduced it to the people. He said, I am going to introduce my Messiah through baptism, and I am going to prepare the people through baptism. The quotation that we left out in Mark chapter 1 says that God, through Isaiah, makes the point that he is going to prepare a people for the coming one, for the coming of the Messiah. And God gave him baptism for that purpose. Well, what else did he give him baptism for? I did not know him. But that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. Again, linking water to baptism. And John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize. Now again, there is direct evidence that God the Father sent John to baptize. He who sent me to baptize with water Again, linking water to baptism, said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So God introduced Jesus to Israel through his baptism. Jesus was baptized. John baptized all of the people. And then interestingly enough, Jesus started baptizing. But let's look at this verse. I want to talk about it just for a minute. God said this through Isaiah. He said, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You think God didn't know that baptism was going to be corrupted in the very second century, just 100, 150 years after Jesus' death on the cross, the Catholic Church was already teaching that baptism was sprinkling, and that very quickly after that, they began to teach many other things about baptism, and that during the Middle Ages and during the uh, Reformation movement, baptism went through so many controversies, and today there are multitudes of people who claim Jesus as their Lord who have never been baptized. And God knew that. And God understood that, and I believe that's why he introduces baptism through John. He doesn't wait until Jesus, at the end of his life, saying, oh, oh yeah, and by the way, here's a new ordinance that you've never heard of before, and this is what I want you to do. He doesn't do that. He, the entire time that John is preaching, the entire time that Jesus is preaching, he is preaching what? He is preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, a baptism in water, a baptism that is an immersion, a baptism that is linked to repentance and to the remission of sins and to making disciples. And so there really isn't anything new at the end of the Gospels. It's already been revealed. Jesus is just taking what God had revealed to Israel at the beginning of the Gospel and incorporating it into his teaching that would remain. If anything, the baptism of Jesus is much, much more powerful 
than the baptism of John. If John's baptism was important, and it was, as we'll see in a moment, but nothing compared to what Jesus' baptism can do. So God knew these controversies would arise, and Jesus didn't introduce baptism at the end of his life. Baptism was already being practiced. As a matter of fact, right after he was baptized, I'm going to skip that because we've already talked about it. <clears throat> in Luke 3, verses 3 and 4, it says this. He went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. Now, isn't that fascinating that John, or Luke links John's baptism to Isaiah's prophecy? The prophecy in Isaiah of the coming Messiah building a road of him preparing the way, of knocking down the mountains and raising up the valleys. What did he use? He used baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He used that preaching. That's all John preached. You know, today people talk about preaching Jesus, but what John preached was baptism, and it became his name, John the Baptist. That ought to tell us something. For God to give a man and give him the name John the Baptist and give him a message of preaching baptism ought to tell us that God wanted it clearly understood that baptism was an integral part even from the beginning of the gospel. And yes, it was a different baptism, but no, very few things changed. It still brings remission of sins. It still requires repentance. It still makes disciples. It's still in water and it is still an immersion. And of course, it is an immersion of adults because you can't repent. If it's a baptism of repentance, you can't administer it to children because children don't have a mind to change yet. Infants do not have any ability to change their mind or their thinking. So all of this has already been dealt with before Jesus or before Peter ever got up in Acts chapter 2. So as John was preaching a baptism of repentance and remission of sins, it was as it is written in Isaiah. When John preached, it was like as, even as, according as, and in the same manner as, Isaiah had said it would be. So baptism became the fulfillment of the book of Isaiah where God explained this to his people. And I think it's important, brethren, that we understand that even if we never teach this to other people, at least in the back of our own minds, we need to understand that this was a big deal. That when John started preaching, he preached something that was never preached before. Matter of fact, when they sent the delegation from Jerusalem, that was their big concern. Why are you baptizing? You don't have any authority in the book of Moses. You don't have any authority from anything that we can see in the old law. Where do you get the authority for this? And again, John points to the future. He points to Jesus and he says, that's where my authority is coming from. And of course, that's where our authority is coming from too. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. So Jesus was also baptizing. He used the ordinance of baptism just like John did. He too was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He too was preaching the gospel, and as he was preaching, they were baptizing. Now verse 23, John also was baptizing in, in near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. And when they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So we need to see our crucified Savior is in his work as a preacher. He's baptizing people. Matter of fact, the Pharisees hear a very interesting point, and that is when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So in the course of Jesus' life, his preaching <coughs> baptized more people than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to go to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria and, of course, then the story of the Samaritan woman. But in the initial period of the gospel, before John was put into prison, before John was removed and, of course, destroyed by Herod, he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And everybody was coming, and everybody was being baptized by him in the Jordan River, including Jesus, who went down into the water 
where he was baptized. Of course, the word baptized means immerse. It means to wash. It means to bury. And there was no question, no doubt, no controversy in the first century regarding the fact that baptism was a burial. Even Paul in Romans 6, 3, and 4, we are buried with him through baptism. How can we be buried with him through baptism if we're sprinkled? How can we be buried with him through baptism if we are poured? Or excuse me, if water is poured on us? Why would they go down into the river? No one who doesn't believe in immersion, has a baptistry in their building. They don't go down into the water and they don't come up out of the water. Why? Because you don't need to go down into the water or come up out of the water if you're getting water sprinkled on your head. Or if they're getting a cup and dip it in. Why would you take your shoes off? Why would you go into the water? Why would you get your feet wet? Why would you get the, the possibility of getting your clothes all wet just to have somebody sprinkle a little bit of water on you? It's just not something people would do. But the definition of baptism is an immersion. And for that, you have to go down into the water. So again, all of these controversies were already resolved and clarified before Jesus ever introduced baptism. Because it had already been introduced. John's baptism is not very different from Jesus' baptism. Except for the one point that Paul will point out in Acts chapter 19, which we won't get to today. But it also says disciples were made through baptism. And that's a very critical point. Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. As far as John was concerned, as far as Jesus was concerned, you had to have baptism if you wanted to be a disciple. You couldn't become a disciple unless you were baptized because that's what John was preaching. And therefore, they all understood this and it wasn't a controversy. So how could God have made it any clearer? Baptism, repentance, remission of sins, becoming a disciple, water, immersion, all clarified and put into stone before Jesus ever even had to say a word about baptism. <clears throat> and so this was already understood. Now in Luke chapter 7, Jesus says this, when all the purple people heard him, and that's John the Baptist, that shouldn't be capitalized, when all the people heard him, John, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Now, this is Jesus' own assessment. Now, again, this is John's baptism, certainly. But don't you think he might say the same thing about his baptism? If those who rejected John's baptism rejected the counsel of God or the will of God or the purpose of God and if those who accepted John's baptism justified God by giving that commandment then how could Jesus say well but it doesn't matter now even though I gave the same commands even stronger than John did as we'll see in a few moments you don't have to do it today this verse ought to strike fear in the heart of anyone who hasn't been baptized because these are Jesus own words the tax collectors, the publicans, it was not faith in John's preaching, but their baptism that justified and declared God just. These are not my words. These are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus understood what the purpose of baptism was going to be, and he understood why his father introduced it through John, and he understood exactly what he was going to do with baptism after his resurrection, which is exactly what he did. But he makes it clear here, and there's no conflict whatsoever, there's no question whatsoever that the things Jesus says about John's baptism, Paul and the apostles and the Holy Spirit are going to verify and solidify with Jesus' baptism. So if rejecting John's baptism brought this condemnation, then rejecting Jesus' baptism is going to bring a greater condemnation because it's a greater and more powerful ordinance. So it wasn't faith in John's preaching, but their baptism that justified God. Rejecting John's baptism, rejected the will, the purpose, or the counsel. That's what the Greek word means, and each translation has a different translation here. Some have will, some have purpose, some have counsel. Because you're rejecting God's will, you're rejecting God's purpose and God's counsel if you refuse to be baptized with John's baptism, and brethren, I can say with all assurance that the same thing is true today. 
that those who reject the baptism of Jesus Christ are going to hear the same condemnation that Jesus is describing. Because as I said, if Jesus felt that way about John's, what about his? So what did Jesus do with baptism? Let's compare. Let's compare John chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 1 with Mark chapter 16. The beginning of Mark, the be, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said at the end of the book, preach the gospel to every creature. Exactly the same. Parallel completely. John started preaching the gospel. Jesus was preaching the gospel. We read in Mark chapter 4, he was preaching the gospel in all the synagogues. And what was a part of that, what was a part of that gospel? Baptism. So at the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is written in the prophets, John came baptizing, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out and were all baptized by him. Now I tried to highlight and change the color of the parallels between how the book began and how it ends. So just as John was preaching and all the land of Judea and Jerusalem and were all baptized by him, Jesus told his apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then again, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, can you see how futile the argument is that people make? Well, he didn't say, and he who does not believe and is not baptized. So obviously baptism wasn't the critical thing. Well, if you've read the first part of Mark, you'd already know that wasn't true. That's all John was preaching. What else could they believe? If they rejected baptism, they were rejecting the counsel of God, the purpose of God, the will of God. And so John came baptizing, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins at the command of God. And that's exactly what Jesus tells his apostles they're going to do. And brethren, that's exactly what we need to be doing today. So God had already explained. While many act like the words of Jesus stand alone. Or that we can just start in Mark 16. That's where it all starts. That's all, that's, that's all we know about baptism is what Jesus said in Mark 16. And clearly in Mark 16, it's obvious that baptism wasn't the critical thing there because he didn't repeat it. And you're looking at that and you're thinking, oh, wait a minute. We started the book. The context of the book is that baptism was from the very beginning of the gospel. It was necessary and everyone was required to do it. And so when Jesus ends the book the same way that he began, that the book began, how can we misunderstand what was being said there? So many like to act like the words of Jesus stand alone or that the apostles were only hearing these things for the first time. But they've been doing it for three years. For three years, they've been working with Jesus. They've been making disciples. They've been baptizing disciples. They've been immersing people in water. And so, and Israel already knew that God had placed baptism into the gospel through John's preaching. And they already knew that Jesus had said, if you reject baptism, you reject the counsel and the will of God. <clears throat> and so they knew it was connected to repentance and to the remission of sins. And they also understood that everyone was commanded to do it. Now at the end of Mark, or excuse me, at the end of Matthew, he says this. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Now this isn't the first time that this was stated. This isn't the first time. This, this is what the apostles had always been doing. They knew exactly what he was asking them to do. They'd been making and baptizing more disciples than John, even while John was still alive. And so they understood the nature of baptism. They understood when he said baptizing them, they knew it was in water. They knew it was for mission of sins. They knew it was to make disciples. He was simply giving them confirmation that nothing's going to change as the gospel continues to be preached. John started preaching the gospel with a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now Jesus will explain to us how this is going to be modified. So after all the authority given to Moses and all the authority given to the prophets was taken from them and given to Jesus, that's what he said, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine now. No, none for Moses. Moses had already told the people, when this new prophet comes, you listen to him. And so everything in the law was gone. The law was nailed to the cross. And now Jesus has all authority. And after that, he says, you will make disciples by baptizing them. 
So how can you make disciples without baptism? Well, the fact is that you can't. Now let's look at the beginning and the end of Luke. At the beginning of Luke, now remember the first two chapters of Luke are dealing with the, the birth of Jesus, excuse me, the birth of John, the birth of Jesus, and all of the elements of regard, surrounding Jesus, and then of course him being taken into Egypt. And now in chapter 3, the actual beginning, just like Mark chapter 1, he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The end of the book. Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Now look at the similarity there. What is John preaching? A baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What are they going to be preaching? Repentance and remission of, of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. There is no difference between what John was preaching. The only difference is the time frame. Paul said, John preached a baptism for the one who was to come. We're preaching a baptism for the one who came. But other than that, the similarities are, are nearly identical. Now, what we need to realize is that he said, well, let me, let me make this one last point here. He says, <clears throat> right here, where's this going to start? Well, it's going to start in Jerusalem. What's going to happen in Jerusalem? Repentance and remission of sins is going to be preached in his name. So when Peter gets up in Acts 2, we're going to see exactly how this ties together. And of course, you already know where I'm going because baptism forms the focal point in that sermon. <clears throat> of course, Peter gets up in Acts 2. He says, men and brethren, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, by mighty works, wonders, and signs, which he did in your midst, and you know he did them. And they couldn't argue with that. You killed him. Well, it just happened 50 days ago. They couldn't argue with that. God raised him from the dead. The proof he gave was the prophecies and the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. Then he proves that he's now at the right hand of God exalted because you see these tongues of fire on my head, you hear me speaking in a language I don't know, and I'm telling you, that's what this means. So they stop him. They interrupt the sermon. They were cut to the heart. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And those who received his word were baptized. Now, look at the parallel between Luke. Repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And the passage in Acts Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Repentance and remission of sins. Repentance and remission of sins. But baptism is right in the middle of those two. And so what John started, Jesus just continued. What John started and Jesus continued, Peter continued after Jesus went back to heaven. No real change. It was just pretty much seamless. It wasn't any real change at all to the ordinance or to what was taught around the ordinance. The only difference was the, bat, the remission of sins that John was preaching came from the blood of bulls and goats, came from that passage in Romans chapter 3 that we've been studying, that through the forbearance of God and the passing over of sins done aforetime, but what baptism did for the people is exactly what the, the blood of bulls and goats did for the people with their animal sacrifices. Not so with the baptism that Peter is preaching. God made it clear. Nothing changed. Still in water. Still immersion. Still to make disciples. Still tied to repentance. Still tied to remission of sins. Still completely and utterly commanded. Still a part of the will of God. There's just no way that we can miss that. Now, John preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And Peter preached, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Does it sound pretty close? I'm sorry I didn't bold and highlight this section because I forgot. But for the remission of sins, for the remission of sins. Repent, repentance. Be baptized, baptism. What's the difference? Tell me the difference. 
what John was preaching that Jesus demanded everyone obey in order to become a disciple, Peter preached. And then Jesus really, I think, cemented it when he said this in Matthew 26, 28. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, the Greek grammar, the Greek word ace is the same here, it's the same here, it's the same here. The term remission, same here, same here, same here. Whoops, same here. The remission of sins, remission of sins, remission of sins, for the remission of sins, for the remission of sins, for the remission of sins. What did the Baptist tell us? That means because of. Well, did Jesus shed his blood because of the remission of sins? Because he already, was already there? Is that why he shed his blood? No, Jesus shed his blood to bring remission of sins. John preached a baptism of repentance, not because of remission of sins, but to bring remission of sins. And Peter preached for the re baptism for the remission of sins to bring Remission of sins. Remission of sins has always been linked to baptism, just like it's always been linked to the blood of Christ. <clears throat> Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. The apostles were to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. What's the difference? What God introduced to John didn't change materially. They were still being baptized for the remission of sins. They were still repenting and being baptized for the remission of sins. They were still being immersed in the water of baptism, just like John had been doing. So baptism and becoming a disciple have been linked from the moment God first introduced baptism to Israel. When God introduced baptism to Israel, it wasn't to only be for John. This was to continue into the new covenant. And that's why it's part of the beginning of the gospel, and that's why it's continued with the gospel. Now, here's two more passages. I came baptizing with water. This is John. He who sent me to baptize with water. John baptizing in Aden near Salem because there was much water, and they were all baptized by him in the Jordan River. Well, Acts chapter 8, verse 36, here, here is water. How did the eunuch make that connection? He didn't even know who Jesus was when he's reading Isaiah the prophet. He doesn't know anything. He, doesn't, he hadn't heard anything about the gospel. He doesn't know anything about baptism. Where did he get that? Well, Peter, excuse me, Philip started preaching Jesus to him. And as he preached Jesus to him, and he's teaching and teaching and guiding him clearly, and he sees the water and says, I want to be baptized. Where did he make that connection? He made that connection because the eunuch was taught by Philip the same thing that we teach and the same thing that Peter taught and the same thing that John taught, that baptism and the remission of sins are linked. So Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Then when Peter is preaching to Cornelius' household and they start speaking in tongues, what's the first thing Peter says? Can anyone forbid the water? He understood like we understand, like John understood, that baptism is the link to remission of sins. And without baptism, there is no link between remission of sins and that individual. They, if we reject the counsel of God for ourselves, there is no remission of sins. <clears throat> wow, I guess, I, I guess that's it. I thought I had more. I think you can tell this is a passionate subject with me. I've had many battles with people. I've watched many people lose their souls, forever miss out on remission of sins because of the error they've been taught on baptism. Now, this is just the first lesson. There are other types. The types in the shadows. We know what types and shadows are. They are, like Peter in, uh, in 1 Peter 3, he says that baptism is the true antitype of Noah's Ark. So we have type and antitype. The type is everyone who got on the ark was saved and those who did not on get on the ark were perished. They perished. Baptism, the same thing. Those who were baptized will be saved. Those who are not baptized are rejecting the counsel of God. They're going to be lost. Well, how many types are there? 
Well, there are many different types. Baptism is a new birth. It is being born of water and the Spirit. Baptism is like getting on Noah's Ark. Baptism is like going through the Red Sea with Moses. Baptism is joining Jesus on the cross in his tomb and in his resurrection to walk in newness of life. Baptism is the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. There are so many things that God uses. He says, if you can't understand baptism is important for John, from John's circumstance, can't you understand it with Noah's Ark? Or going through the Red Sea with Moses? Or being born again of water and the Spirit? Can't you understand that baptism is the link? And it all started from the moment John began to preach it, that, that nothing, that John didn't preach anything about baptism that the apostles didn't take and include except one thing. He's coming. And Paul said, we don't preach that. We preach he came. That's the only difference is the direction that the faith is pointing in. Everything else is identical. Nothing changed. Everyone was baptized by John. Everyone was baptized by Jesus while they were on the earth. And everyone that received Peter's word were baptized. So why should today be any different? <clears throat> as far as I know, the Church of Christ is the only church that is teaching all of this. As far as I'm aware, I've studied with a lot of different groups. There may be some groups out there that I don't know very much about who are teaching the power of baptism. And if they are, I'm happy to hear that because I wish everyone was preaching that because it's true. And if you haven't been baptized, then you've rejected God's counsel for yourself. And you haven't accepted his purpose or his plan or his will, which is what baptism is. It's his purpose, his plan, and his will. When we see what, what Paul says about baptism in Romans 6 and Colossians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 2, as he ties together the fact that in baptism we join Jesus. We actually enter into a fellowship with Jesus. I think that's why he says in Matthew chapter 7, I never knew you. Because unless you're baptized, Jesus can't know us. If we haven't been immersed in water for the remission of sins, Jesus doesn't know us. And there's so many people today Jesus doesn't know. And so as we sing the song of encouragement, you cannot be whiter than snow unless you have been baptized and received the remission of your sins. Or as Paul said, or as Paul was told, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. How could Ananias say that? Well, because that's what had been taught from the very beginning. As we sing the song of encouragement, if there's anyone in the audience today who would like to make their life right with God, who needs to be baptized into Christ and put on Christ, we invite you to come while we together stand and sing.